And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 7. Uh, a few weeks ago, we started a series titled Encounters with Jesus, and this is part of our bigger theme for this year, which is just all about Jesus. So we're walking through the Gospels all year long, looking at the life, the teachings, and the ministry of Jesus. And we're starting by looking at these individual encounters that, that people had with the real Jesus. These are real people with a real Jesus and, and how these encounters impacted their lives. And so today we're going to Luke chapter 7, and uh, we're going to pick it up at verse 36. Um, this is an encounter with two different people and Jesus, and, and they each kind of have their own unique encounter in the same place at the same time. And we're going to unpack that today. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 says this, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Let me pause right there. For those of you who've spent a good amount of time at the church, maybe you've spent time reading the Bible, this story may sound familiar to you, and and there are probably a few reasons for that, um, but one of them is because there are actually two separate encounters where a, a woman anoints the feet of Jesus. So there are two different times where that takes place in his ministry, and Luke records one of them right here, and then Matthew, Mark, and John record the other occurrence. So the other time it happens is at the end of Jesus's ministry, actually during Holy Week, right before he goes to the cross, and Mary of Bethany, also Mary and Martha, the same person here, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, she anoints the feet of Jesus. And, and so we have that encounter with Mary anointing Jesus, and then we have this encounter. And this is actually a nameless woman, but there's this kind of church tradition that, that some people think this is Mary Magdalene. So that complicates it even more because you got two different people named Mary. The truth is we don't know. We don't know who this woman is. The reason why people think it might be Mary Magdalene is because if you just look at the very next chapter, you will see that Jesus goes on from there about his ministry with the disciples. And then it lists some women who go with him, one of them being Mary Magdalene. And it says that he cast seven spirits out of her, seven demons out of that woman. And so some people think it's her, but we really don't know. We don't know who this woman is. Um, and then to make it even more complicated, both of these events happen in a person's house named Simon, but it's two different Simons. So there's Simon the leper, and then there's Simon the Pharisee, as we'll see here in just a moment. So today we are looking at the encounter between Jesus and this, as the text describes her, sinful woman and Simon the Pharisee. And so it begins with Simon inviting Jesus, this Pharisee inviting Jesus to come and have dinner with him. And I just want to point this out. Jesus eats with everyone. Like if you haven't caught on to that, Jesus eats with everyone. He will eat with, with the self-righteous and, and the hyper-religious, including the Pharisees. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus ate with Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, and other sinners, disreputable people that everybody else criticized Jesus for doing so. Jesus just said, look, I, I, I came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through me. So Jesus just said, I, I'm here to, to eat with anyone. I'll sit at anybody's table. I will have a meal with anyone. And, and listen to me, brothers and sisters, we should live like Jesus. We should be willing to sit down at anyone's table and eat with anyone. There should be no one that we say, no, no, I don't associate with them. Even if they voted different than you, you should be willing to sit down at their table and eat with them. Even if their lifestyle looks completely different than yours, even if you disagree with everything that they believe in or everything that they do, Jesus would eat with anyone and so should you and so should I. And so here Jesus is sitting down in the house of Simon the Pharisee because he was invited. And I love how Jesus continually shows up in other people's spaces so Jesus isn't always inviting people into his place. He's actually going to where they are. He's making himself uncomfortable by going into places where other people are most comfortable to minister to them and to meet them where they are. And so that's exactly what he does with Simon. He's invited, and so he shows up to this Pharisee's house. And then look at verse 37 with me again. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life 
learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she had that information. She knew where Jesus was. She knew who knew whose house it was. And so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Let me just pause there for a second. So the text describes her as a woman who lived a sinful life. Some of your translations may read a certain immoral woman. Others may read a woman of the city who was a sinner. Now, let's be clear. At this moment, when Luke is writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he is very clear on the fact that everybody is a sinner. No doubt. No question. So when he gives this detail, what he's telling us is not that she was a sinner and other people weren't. He's telling us, no, no, no. Her sin was on public display. Everybody knew about her sin. Her sin was very overt. It was very obvious. It, she had a reputation about her. That's what he's trying to get at here. There was this woman who carried a sinful reputation about her. It was very public that she was a very sinful woman. And it's that woman that learned that Jesus was at a Pharisee's house. Can I remind you, the Pharisees were the religious leaders they, they were the ones who thought they were holier than everyone else. They were the teachers of the law. They wanted nothing to do with even just the common people, let alone a, a woman who was known for her reputation as a sinner. And the text doesn't give us the detail, but it was most likely a very shameful sin. And so, so the courage and the bravery and the faith of this woman to say, I, I don't care where Jesus is. I heard he's nearby. I've got to get to him. Even if it means that other people are going to look at me and, and, and maybe judge me and try to condemn me, even if they're going to cast shame upon me, I've got to get to the feet of Jesus. That is some incredible faith from this sinful woman. And so she said, whatever it takes, I'm going to Jesus. I've got to get to the feet of of Jesus. And as she stood behind him, verse 38, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now in that moment, this would have been incredibly uncomfortable for everyone. This was really culturally highly inappropriate. Again, not, not just for, for the sinful woman, for any woman to approach a rabbi like this, to get that close to him, even just to let her hair down in that environment, in that setting with other men present, and, and then to engage with Jesus in this way, to encounter him in this way, highly inappropriate would have created a whole lot of awkwardness for everyone there. But this woman just, just simply didn't care. So we, we don't know for sure, but there is actually a chance that she had previously already encountered Jesus just simply because of her reaction here, because of her response. She already knew something about Jesus. We don't know how, we don't know where it came from, but she knew enough to know that there was something different about this man, there was something unique about him, and that he was going to meet her with grace and mercy, that he was worthy of her worship. And so, so maybe she had an encounter before, or maybe she had just heard the good news about him. But either way, this woman shows up and, and does something that is completely culturally inappropriate. Now, culturally inappropriate, but historically not unprecedented. I want to remind you of a time where there was this king named David who heard that the Ark of the Covenant was coming into Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. And so because he heard, did you see how cool that was when I said God? Did you hear that, like, that reverb? I wish I could say that, like, that was intentional, but. David heard that the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God was coming in. And so what did he do? He stripped down half naked, the king of Israel, stripped down half naked and went out and danced in the street. And his wife was so offended by it because she said he's dancing in front of the other slave women. And his response to his wife was, I will be even more undignified than this for my God. And so even though this woman's response maybe was culturally inappropriate, there was a historical precedence in, in their faith that this was the only right response when you encounter the presence of God is to fall down 
and worship at his feet. But I want to I want to make sure you don't miss this. I want you to watch how she worshiped him. And watch what she worshiped him with. Look at this. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. She kissed them, and then she poured perfume on them. She worshiped Jesus with whatever she had. And in this moment, what she had were tears, her hair, her affection, and then watch this, her perfume. And, and because we have another encounter where the, another woman anoints the feet of Jesus, in that other encounter, when the perfume is poured out, she's actually criticized because of how wasteful that others said this was. And they said it was worth 300 denarii, or roughly a year's wages. And so this woman, in this moment, pours out her perfume on the feet of Jesus, most likely a year's worth of wages. She worships him with everything that she has. With all that she has, she worships with her tears, with her hair, with her emotions, with her affection, and then with her perfume. And again, we don't know her sin, but we can assume because of the way the text describes it, that in that day when a woman was described as living a sinful lifestyle, it almost always meant that she was a prostitute. And the way in which she would have drawn men to her was through putting on this perfume as a sign that she was available. And so this woman takes what everybody else would say is completely unholy in every way. But it's all she has. And she empties it on the feet of Jesus. As if to say, I'm turning from that life. I, I, I'm surrendering everything I have to you. I'm walking away forever because I've found freedom in you. You have set me free. And so now you are worthy of it all. Everything that I have, I have nothing else to give. So I'm going to give you literally everything I have. A year's worth of my wages as, as well as any future wages that I could ever earn. I'm going to lay it all down at your feet. The world may say that it's unholy. The world may say that I'm unholy, but this is what I have. And so this is what I'm coming to give. And that's how she worships. Jesus. So can I just challenge all of us that worship is far more than showing up on a Sunday morning and singing a few songs. And for those of you who are like me and you got just a little bit of Pentecostal left in you, it's more than even raising your hand from time to time. Worship is an act of sacrifice. It's everything that you have. It's saying, God, I'm turning away from anything and everything else that the world has to offer. I'm going to give you my life. Everything that I have belongs to you. It's an act of sacrifice. So this woman shows an act of faith and an act of repentance here in this moment and worships Jesus. And look at verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. So the Pharisee begins to judge Jesus, begins to critique Jesus. He wasn't sure about this Jesus. He had heard about him. He was curious, heard about this teacher, this, this rabbi, this miracle worker, this possible Messiah. And so he invites Jesus into his home, but then he begins to critique him when he sees this sinful woman come and encounter Jesus, get that up close and personal with Jesus. He begins to criticize him in his own heart. Watch this. He said it to himself. He didn't say it to anyone else. He just said it to himself that this man were a prophet. So he now starts to assume Jesus is not really all that powerful. He must not truly be a prophet because if he was, he would know who this woman is. I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. Be very wary of overly religious people 
who create obstacles and barriers to keep sinners from Jesus. Those people are furthest from the heart of God. And yet they claim to be closest. So be very, very cautious. Whenever you find yourself around someone who is overly re religious and yet they're setting up any sort of barrier or any sort of obstacle that would keep anyone from the feet of Jesus. Yeah. The closer we are to the heart of God, the more our desire should be that anyone and everyone would come to Jesus and find life and freedom in his name. And we would be the ones removing the obstacles, not creating them. And so let me, let me also just say to those of you who have people in your life who are so far from God that want nothing to do with him, don't focus on their sin. Don't get so caught up in their sinful life. I get it. Like it can be really difficult. It can be really hard to know what to do and how to navigate. I, I've shared my story last week about, about my own brother and just the challenges that our family faced. But I just want to encourage you, don't, don't buy into the lie from the enemy that you have to first address their sin and then Jesus can change their life. It's the complete opposite. It will never happen until they encounter Jesus. So all I want to encourage you to do is get them to Jesus. Whatever it takes, do everything in your power to get them to the feet of Jesus. Do not create a bar barrier. Do not create an obstacle. You go out of your way to remove those obstacles and to remove those barriers to get them to Jesus. And I also just want to say this because we live in a world that has lost its mind, lost its mind. We live in a culture that is so far from God in every way where the sin is so obviously on display. Everywhere you look, sin is so obviously on display. Hear me. Your battle is not against the sin. Your battle is for the sinner. Your job is to fight for the sinner because just like them, you're a sinner who's been saved by God's grace. And so don't get hyper-focused on trying to address all the sin of our culture. And can I also just challenge for just a moment here, can I just step on a few toes for just a moment here, the idea that we could somehow take our nation back in time to a time period that was less sinful is actually unbiblical. <laughs> the sin is just more on display now. It was just better hidden before. It's the same sin. It's always been, been there. Sin has always existed. So our job is not to take us back to any place and it's not to take us to the left or to take us to the right. It's to take people to Jesus. Stop making somebody else other than Jesus king of your life or our nation. And stop letting that divide us. Our job is to take people to Jesus and to do everything we can to remove every barrier. I don't care what's going on in their life. Get them here. There, there are no prerequisites to coming to church here other than then we would just say like wear some clothes and King David showed up half naked. So I don't even know how many clothes you have to wear. <laughs> like you're welcome, everybody, no matter what their issue is, no matter what their situation is, you're welcome here. And we're fighting for you, not against you. And now listen to me. I'm not trying to say that we want to encourage people to live in their sin. We don't. We want people to be set free. But the way they're going to be set free is by meeting Jesus right where they are. I've said it every week in this series, if your faith makes you uncomfortable with sinners, then you're too religious for Jesus. That's the bottom line. Like if your faith makes, puts you in this place where you can't associate with sinners, where, where you want nothing to do with them, then you're just too religious for Jesus. Because Jesus said, I, I, I came for the sinners. Like that's, that's the only people I showed up for. Because guess what? That's the only people there are. That's all that exists. So look at verse 40. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? 
Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. So go back to Simon the Pharisee's initial reaction. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, if this man really were a prophet, he would know who this woman is. He would know her past. He would know her sin. He would know the condition of her heart. And then Jesus says, Simon, I am a prophet. And I'm going to tell you the condition of your own heart right now. And he addresses Simon's heart here when he gives this example. And, and just do not miss this. Verse 42, he says, first at verse 41, he says, one of them owed him 500 in there, the other 50. If you're not careful, you can find yourself playing the game of my sin is not as great as theirs. Yeah. And all of a sudden you start thinking, well, as long as my sin's better than theirs or it's not as much as theirs, then I'm good. Don't miss verse 42. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. That's the point of the story. Neither one of them had any money to pay him back. They couldn't repay the debt, period. It doesn't matter if it was five or 50 or 500 or 5,000. Neither one of them had the money to pay him back. And that's Jesus' whole point. Nobody can repay their debt of sin. So you may feel like your sin isn't as great as somebody else's, but guess what? To God, it was great enough that Jesus died on the cross for it. He went to the cross for your sin to pay your debt because you couldn't repay it. So stop playing the comparison game. The only comparison is I don't have enough to repay it, and Jesus does. That's what we look to, and that's who we look to. And I love the question that Jesus asked him. Now, which one of them will love him more? Which one of them will love him more? And I can just totally see Simon, this Pharisee, this, this religious teacher who probably generally holds his composure very well. I don't know if I'm reading into the text or not, but I just, when I read this, I just see him saying this kind of like my 10-year-old daughter. Which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who has the bigger debt. <laughs> I guess. I guess it was, the, you know, can, can't you just see the attitude coming out? He doesn't answer clearly. He just says, I suppose. I suppose is the one with the bigger debt. That's Simon's response. This is, a, this is a teacher of the law. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Jesus said, you have judged correctly. When we recognize the gravity of our sin and how great of a sacrifice Jesus paid to forgive us, the only right response is to love him greatly and to love everyone else. Not to judge them, but to love them. Look at verse 44. Pay attention to the language of the text. Then he turned toward the woman. Turned toward the woman who everybody else had been talking about but nobody was addressing turned toward the woman and then said to Simon, do you see this woman? Now we're going to get to the rest of what he said, but I just want us to pause there for a moment because that question is so powerful. He turned toward the woman and then he said to Simon, I, I can just imagine him locking eyes with the woman. Simon's over here. He's talking to Simon, says Simon, but he's looking at the woman and he just says, do you see this woman? Like, do you really see her? Do you see this woman or do you just see a sinner? Do you see this woman or do you just see her sin? Do you see this woman? Do you see her how I see her? Do you see her as the one who is created in my image? The one that I formed in her mother's womb? The one that I have great plans for? The one that I want to set free? Do you see this woman made in the image of God? Do you see her? And then he says, I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet but she wet my feet with her, her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured out perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, listen to this language, her many sins have been forgiven. Past tense, have been. They've been taken care of. 
not because of what she's done here today. She understands she's forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. So as Jesus makes this comparison between the two, everybody in the room prior to this moment would have thought that what this woman has done is improper, immodest, inappropriate, and culturally so. But what nobody had probably paid attention to was the fact that Simon had also treated Jesus improperly. When you enter into someone's house in this first century world, the expectation as the host is, is that they would give you water for your feet because your feet were filthy. You were used to walking in bare feet or in sandals along dirty, dusty, disgusting roads. And so when you show up in someone's house, the bare minimum expectation was that you would offer them some water so they could wash their feet. Simon did not. And then from there, the expectation would be that you would greet one another with a holy kiss, like many cultures still do around our world today, a kiss on the cheek, and Simon the Pharisee did not. And the expectation when you had especially a guest of honor is that you would offer oil for their head, and Simon the guest of honor did not, or Simon did not treat Jesus this way. He didn't offer any of that. And so yes, may, maybe culturally what the woman did was inappropriate, but the same is true for, for Simon. But in the kingdom of heaven, what the woman did was completely appropriate and actually the only right response. And so, so I just want to challenge you, and, and this is convicting for me too, like if I'm going to err on one side or the other, I would rather be criticized by the culture for my radical love for Jesus than lack thereof. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lord. Simon chose to not honor Jesus. And this sinful woman lavished honor upon him. And so therefore she was most likely criticized, accused, things assumed about her. But she understood forgiveness. She understood God's forgiveness for her. And the only right response then was was to lavish honor upon the one who had set her free. You and I, we have the choice. We can either withhold honor or we can lavish honor. And, and I want to be the kind of church where we're just, we're going to lavish honor upon God. We're going to never let the standards of the culture around you be your litmus test for what's appropriate or not when it comes to worshiping God, when it comes to the way in which you live your life for God. She lavished honor upon him. And so then look at verse 48. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now she understood that already. This, Jesus had already acknowledged that she understood that. So he's not just saying this for her. We're, we're going to get there. But he's saying this for the other people in the room. Look at verse 49. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? So it's not for her. It, it is, but it's not just for her. It, it's for everybody else to understand that he has the power and the authority to forgive sins. Verse 50, Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The greatest gift Jesus could ever give any one of us is the forgiveness of our sins. And he's already given it to you. The greatest gift. So if you never get anything else from Jesus for the rest of your life, if all you ever get from him is forgiveness for your sins, that is enough. And it's enough for you to lavish worship and honor and surrender and sacrifice upon him. And that's exactly what this woman understood. And so Jesus turned and said to her, your sins are forgiven. He said it to her in the presence of others so that they would understand it too. But I also think there's something so powerful about this that Jesus looked her in the eyes because he's already said it about her. Again, look at verse 47. I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. He's talking to Simon when he said that. But then he looks her in the eyes. And I think it's simply because sometimes we need 
to hear those words directly from Jesus. And so I, I just want everybody in the room right now to just, for just a moment, lock eyes with me as I speak the words of Jesus to you. If you, if you are in Christ, if you've put your faith in him, listen to me. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Your sins are forgiven. Listen to me, your, your sins are forgiven. Past, present, future forgiven. Jesus has paid the price for them all. Your sins are forgiven. So, so when the enemy comes against you and tries to lie to you and accuse you, you stand firm on the truth of the words of Jesus. Let's say your sins are forgiven. It's not just that they were forgiven. It's that they are forgiven once and for all. Your sins are forgiven. And then he said, your faith has saved you. Not, not your actions here today. Now actions follow faith, but it's, it's her faith. It's that faith that, that when she was sitting out on the street corner or at home or wherever she was and she heard that Jesus was in town and when she heard that he was at the Pharisee's house it was that that faith that said well I, I know this is going to be hard I know people are going to judge me I know people are going to condemn me I know they're going to shame me I, I don't like my face to be seen but I believe that he can save me it's that level of faith that said I'm, I just got to get to Jesus and so Jesus said, your faith has saved you, not your actions, good or bad. Your faith in me has saved you. Listen, brothers and sisters, you and I, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, period. That is the whole story. That is the gospel message. If you add anything else to it, you're actually taking away from it. We are saved by grace, through faith, in Christ. And so he tells her, your faith has saved you. And then I love his last words to her, go in peace. You, you can now live a life that you've never lived before. A life of peace. A life of freedom. A life of hope. Go in peace. And again, we don't know, we don't know what happened to her after this fact. Maybe she was one of those women that joined Jesus in his ministry from there on. But we know that on that day, she had an encounter with Jesus that took her from being a sinful woman to a saved one. She went from being known as a sinful woman to a saved one. Jesus was best known by religious people as a friend of sinners. He was criticized by religious people for being a friend of sinners. That is how he was best known by the overly religious people as being a friend of sinners. And Jesus was best known by sinners as the one who set them free. It's not an either or, it's a both and. Yes, we, we want people to encounter Jesus so that they can be set free from their sin. We don't want people to be set free from their sins so that they can encounter Jesus. It doesn't work that way. So listen to me, there, there may be some people who are here today and you feel like you match the description of this sinful woman. Maybe you felt unworthy. Maybe you're tuning in online because you can't step foot in a church because you feel too unworthy, too unholy. And I just want to encourage you, like, all Jesus wants is all you have. That's it. All you have. If all you have is tears, he'll take it. If all you have is affection, he'll receive it. If all you have is your sinful past, bring it to him. Because that's all he wants is all you have. He just wants you to surrender. And he'll take whatever the world calls unholy and he'll redeem it and make it holy. I can only imagine this woman walking around with an empty alabaster jar for the rest of her life and telling the story of how she poured it on the feet of Jesus and she was set free. All he wants is all you have. And that, that's true for the sinful 
and for the self-righteous. Jesus wants to set you free. He wants to set you free. He wants to set you free from that legalism. He wants to set you free from that self-righteousness. He wants to change your heart. He wants to soften it. Jesus came to save sinners because that's the only kind of people there are. It's all that exists. Be it sin of, of very public display or, or hidden sin or, or self-righteousness, we all need set free. So I'm, I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to ask while I'm praying if our prayer team and elders can make their way down front at this time. And after service, if, if this message in any way has prompted a desire in your heart to take that next step of faith, if you want to come forward and give your life to Christ today, be set free. We want to meet that need. If you've got some area of sin that you need to confess, we want to meet that need. If you just need healing or you just need an encounter with Jesus, we want to, we want to be ready to respond. So if you would pray with me while I'm praying, if our prayer team can make their way down front. Jesus, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that not only do we get to hear about these encounters with you, but that we get to encounter you. I pray right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that every person in this room, every person tuning in online, would have a real, meaningful, powerful encounter with you. Jesus, I pray that you would set people free today. Set them free from self-righteousness. Set them free from sin. I pray that we would come to understand how good your forgiveness really is. And that we would respond the only appropriate way by giving our life to you. All that we have, whatever it is, it's enough. Holy Spirit, I, I pray for the people who, who feel like they identify with this woman, who feel shamed, who feel unworthy, I pray that they would hear your words. Their sins are forgiven. And their faith has saved them. And I pray that they would be able to go in peace. Jesus, we need you. We love you. We surrender to you and we trust you. And we pray this all in your mighty name. And everybody said, Amen.